This is Sunday evening, July the 26th, and we continue our series, Preaching Through the Bible. Our text is found in Nehemiah, chapter 13, verses 1 through 31. How about those ants? A young couple bought a house, moved in, and began some remodeling projects. In the course of their work, they spotted a couple of ants in their basement. A few days later, they found one in their bedroom. It didn't seem like much of a problem, so they set out some ant hotels to trap them. But they never could totally eradicate the ants. Then one day, as they were installing new windows, they noticed some sawdust on a windowsill. With a sense of dread, they wondered if perhaps they had termites. They arranged for a pest inspection. They did not have termites, but they did have carpenter ants. These pests can be more destructive than termites. They destroy anything wooden in order to keep their queen alive. Find the queen and you destroy the colony. In the meantime, if you have no idea where that queen resides, your house is slowly eaten out from under you. Quite literally, it could collapse from the inside. Under godly leadership, the people of Judah built the temple under Zerubbabel. They rebuilt Jerusalem's wall under Nehemiah. They reestablished the city's defenses and reaffirmed the people's sense of identity. The work was done. Nehemiah then, after 12 years, returned to his position in the court of King Artaxerxes in Sushan, Persia. However, whether because of unsettling reports or personal curiosity, Nehemiah returned to Jerusalem. Upon his arrival, he found neglect of the law and abuses among the priests and Levites. The wall surrounding Jerusalem still stood, but within its protection, destructive behaviors and attitudes were spreading. These may have appeared small on the surface and rather non-threatening, but Nehemiah perceived the implications of compromise. In an effort to eradicate spiritual sloth and negligence, he instituted specific reforms. The Jews had violated God's law in five ways. First, the Jews violated the law through evil associations. Look at Nehemiah chapter 13 in the first three verses. On that day they read in the book of Moses in the audience of the people, and therein was found written that the Ammonite and the Moabite should not come into the congregation of God forever, because they met not the children of Israel with bread and with water, but hired Balaam against them, that he should curse them, Albeit our God turned the curse into a blessing. Now it came to pass when they had heard the law that they separated from Israel all the mixed multitude. The story of Balaam can be found in Numbers chapter 23 and 24. The Israelites read their account and decided that the thing to do was to obey the word of God. Some of them had intermarried with Ammonites and Moabites, which God had forbidden. The children of Israel realized they must put them out of the land. Second, the people violated God's law by desecrating the house of God. Look at verses 4 through 9. And before this, Eliashib, the priest, having the oversight of the chamber of the house of our God, was allied unto Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a great chamber, where aforetime they laid the meat offering, the frankincense, 
and the vessels and the tithes of the corn, the new wine and the oil, which was commanded to be given to the Levites and the singers and the porters and the offerings of the priest. But in all this time I was not at Jerusalem. For in the two and thirtieth year of Artaxerxes king of Babylon came I unto the king, and after certain days obtained I leave of the king. And I came to Jerusalem, and understood of the evil that Eliashib did for Tobiah, in preparing him a chamber in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me sore. Therefore I cast forth all the household stuff to Tobiah out of the chamber. Then I commanded, and they cleansed the chambers, and thither brought I again the vessels of the house of God with the meat offering and the frankincense. Eliashib the high priest was the administrator of the temple chambers, the storehouse, where the contributions of the people were brought, tithes, and, a, and so on. Through intermarriage, Elashib was related to Tobiah, the Ammonite, who had caused Nehemiah so much trouble when the wall was built, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 1 through 3, that Elashib had taken one of these sacred rooms and turned it into over to someone as an apartment for non-sacral use was a grave violation and especially so that he was not a Jew. He was an Ammonite, one that Israel was supposed to shun and keep out of their house of God and to keep out of their city. How this entire blasphemous arrangement came about was because of Nehemiah's absence. The temple stores should be brought in again and the vessels of the house of God put in their places. But the chambers must first be sprinkled with the water of purification and so cleansed because they had been profaned. Thus when sin is cast out of the heart by repentance, let the blood of Christ be applied to it by faith and then let it be furnished with the graces of God's Spirit for every good work. The third violation was neglecting the tithe. Let's look at verses 10 through 14. And I perceived that the portions of the Levites had not been given them. For the Levites and the singers that did the work were fled every one to his field. Then contended I with the rulers and said, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Then brought all Judah the tithe of the corn and the new wine and the oil unto the treasuries. And I made treasurers over the treasuries. Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites, Pedadiah, and next to him was Hanan, the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were counted faithful, and their office was to distribute unto their brethren. Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and wipe not out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for the offices thereof. So after throwing Tobiah's possessions out and resettling the storeroom with proper goods, Nehemiah realized that the tithes and contributions for the priests and Levites were missing. Is it any wonder when the storehouse was given over to Tobiah the Ammonite? The incident revealed that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them. These tithes or portions belong to the Levites by command of the law. This was their means of support, enabling them to carry out their duties in the temple. When this source dried up, all the Levites and singers responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields to raise their own crops for food. 
The Levites had moved out of Jerusalem and gone home. Nehemiah responded by rebuking the officials. When he saw an abuse or a violation, he confronted those involved. He pointedly asked them, Why is the house of God neglected? Nehemiah called everyone together and laid out a plan. Collection stations were set up throughout Judah so the people could bring in their tithes more easily and efficiently. As a result, all Judah brought the tithes of grain, new wine, and oil into the storerooms. At the conclusion of each reform instituted by Nehemiah, he offered a prayer asking that God remember what he had done. In this case, Nehemiah asked that God not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. The fourth violation was not honoring the Sabbath and keeping it holy. Verses 15 through 22. In those days saw so I in Judah some treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and lading asses as also wine, grapes, figs, and all manner of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I testified against them in the day wherein they sold victuals. There dwelt men of Tyre also therein which brought fish and all manner of ware and sold on the Sabbath unto the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Ju Judah and said unto them, What evil thing is this that ye do and profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers thus and did not our God bring all this evil upon us and upon this city? Yet ye bring more wrath unto Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And it came to pass that when the gates of Jerusalem began to be dark before the Sabbath, the Sabbath began at sundown, by the way, on Friday evening until sundown on Saturday evening. And Nehemiah said, I commanded that the gates should be shut and charge that they should not be open till after the Sabbath. And some of my servants I set at the gates, that there should be no burden be brought in on the Sabbath day. So the merchants and sellers of all kinds of ware lodged without Jerusalem once or twice. Then I testified against them and said unto them, Why lodge ye about the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. From that time forth came they no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should come and keep the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of thy mercy. You see, the issue of work on the Sabbath arises. The offense is twofold. First, the people of Judah are working on the Sabbath, bringing loads of food into Jerusalem and apparently selling them. Second is the issue of the foreigners, merchants from Tyre, who were selling fish on the Sabbath day as well. Nehemiah's rebuke is a theological one. These Sabbath breakers are placing Israel under the anger of Yahweh again exactly what had happened that cast them into 70 years in Babylonian captivity in the first place. See this same argument pressed by the prophet Jeremiah in the pre-exilic pre period in Jeremiah 17, verses 19 through 27. To prevent further offense, Nehemiah closes and guards the gates just before and after the Sabbath. He places his own men there to prevent traitors from entering the city. And then he makes threats against the lollygaggers. Perhaps these people tried to hang around outside the walls, hoping to draw people outside the city to buy from them. But Nehemiah shuts this off as well. The fifth violation of God's law was intermarriage with unbelievers. Let's look at verses 23 through 31. 
And in those days also I saw Jews that had married wives of Ashdod. Now Ashdod was down in the Philistine territory. And of Ammon, the Amorites, and of Moab, the Moabites. And their children spake half in the speech of Ashdod, and could not speak in the Jews' language, but according to the language of each people. And I contended with them and cursed them, and smote certain of them and plucked off their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, Ye shall not give your daughters unto their sons, nor take their daughters unto your sons, or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations was there no king like him, who was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken unto you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God in marrying strange wives? And one of the sons of Jehodia, the son of Elashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Hornite. Therefore I chased him from me. Remember them, O my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. Thus cleansed I them from all strangers and appointed the wards of the priest and the Levites, every one in his business. And for the wood offering at times appointed and for the first fruits, remember me, O my God, for good. Nehemiah knew from the law of Moses that if God's people were to have a national identity and fidelity to the only true God, it was necessary that they not intermarry with unbelievers. The same goes for Christians today. 2 Corinthians 6, verses 14 through 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Marriage is a challenging enough when both parties are dedicated Christians. But when one of the parties is saved and the other is lost, that marriage goes against the commandments of God. Great sorrow and terrible consequences will result. A national hotel chain once run a television ad that stated, Eternal damnation is for pansies. Try a family vacation if you really want the worst. They expected people to smile and recall some disastrous family excursion. But the comparison is not funny. Eternal judgment is not the territory for humor or flippant remarks. It is a reality that people do not take seriously in our modern world. God's judgment is either discounted and minimized, rejected as being harsh or ignored because, well, God just wouldn't do that. But if the Bible says anything, it warns of judgment. The reason Israel defeated the people of Canaan was in order to exact God's judgment against their sin and disobedience. Nehemiah judged the waywardness of Judah by punishing their defiance. In a culture where moral standards have become unpopular and right and wrong depend on conscience, consensus, the very idea, and the idea of justice has been diluted to monetary settlements and plea bargaining. Society shrugs and wonders, what's the big deal? 
but try cutting in front of someone in traffic at rush hour and suddenly justice becomes an issue. The driver literally screams for retribution. Evidently, an insult matters only if it's against us. But our offenses before God are cosmic. We have assaulted His throne and glory. Yet for some reason we think God should get over it. But what confidence can you have in a God who ignores injustice? What hope is there in a God who trivializes crime? We have lost sight of God's holiness and our depravity. We have defaced the concept of justice and exalted our paltry opinions. It isn't difficult to reconcile judgment and wrath with a God who is holy and sovereign. What is far more incomprehensible is that God has condescended to extend mercy to those who despise Him, to those who trample on His goodness. This God has done through the sacrifice of His Son, Jesus Christ. Next Sunday evening, we will begin the study of the book of Esther, the last of the historical books of the Bible. Let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly, we thank you for the blessing and the opportunity to freely study and read the book that you've given us down through the ages, your message that we can take to heart and apply to the way we live our lives and the faith that we place upon you. Be with us this evening, each person under the sound of my voice. May we all covenant together to keep God's laws, to do what He wants us to do, to live like He wants us to live, and to behave as He would have us behave. In Jesus' name, amen.